Good afternoon, everybody. This is Tim Gleisner from the Library of Michigan. I'm here today with author and poet Jeff Cass talking about his book, the Michigan Notable Book winner, uh, Teacher Pizza Guy by Wayne State University Press. And we're here today to talk about and just ask some questions about what it went what went into the making of this book and just uh, really what Jeff uh, was thinking when he was making this book. And so first of all, I wanted to say, Jeff, hi, how are you today? I'm great, Tim. Thank you for having me. It's very exciting. Yeah, and it's great having you here and thank you for being here. And, um, you know, just Jeff, really, I just wanted to start off just, you know, what's, what, who are you? What's the background of yourself? And, you know, how did you become a poet? And, and you know, just basically, who are you? Great. Well, I'm, I'm a teacher. I teach at Pioneer High School in Ann Arbor, which is the one right across from the football stadium. Okay. I teach 10th grade English in creative writing. And I've been a writer myself for, for a long time. I started writing fiction really ever since I was a kid. And I've been writing fiction and, and published a bunch of fiction. Um, but as far as poetry, I would say it really comes from growing up in the 80s, the beginning of the hip hop movement in New York um, and being on the back of the bus ride from wrestling matches and with my friends playing hip hop and, and, and saying run DMC rhymes and taking the broom handle against the floor of the bus to make a beat and just thinking about language in that way. And since I've always write, loved writing fiction, uh, I thought about maybe writing poems someday, but never really had any formal training in it in undergraduate or, or anything like that. Uh, but when I was living in California in the mid '90s, uh, the poetry slam movement was just getting started. It, it started in Chicago, but you know had reached out to California. Uh, my brother James Cast started the youth poetry slam and youth spoken word movement in San Francisco, and I went to a number of youth slams, nice. and I found it really fascinating. And I love the commitment of the young people to language and writing and. I just love the energy they were bringing to their words. And so I brought a lot of that into my classroom. I was teaching um, on the other side of the Bay in the East Bay. And so I wanted to have my students get involved in youth spoken word and react to literature, not just by writing an analytical essay, but maybe say if we're reading To Kill a Mockingbird, write uh, a poem in the voice of Boo Radley or something like that. And so I, I started writing poems as models to kind of show them, well, here's what you could do. And I always believed in, I never wanted my students to do any kind of assignment I wasn't willing to do myself. So I would make these poems for them. And then I realized I kind of liked them. And I you know, was sort of growing with them with the Poetry Slam movement in, in, movement in the Bay Area. And I started competing in Poetry Slams in the, in the mid 90s. And then when I moved to Ann Arbor in 1997, I started doing the Poetry Slam here and then um, getting a little bit of a national reputation in the, in the Poetry Slam world. And, and that's really where it started. And from there, I got a lot more formal training in writing poetry when I got an MFA um, from the Stone Coast program at the University of Southern Maine. And I got to work with a lot of people like Patricia Smith and Tim Siebels. And that really helped me grow a lot as a, as a poet. And that, that's kind of what got me into it, I would say. Nice. And so why do you feel like you have to write? Why do you think you have, do you, what, what is that urge to write poetry? What is it, you know, that you feel, uh, you know, just the, the reasoning why behind you want to write poetry? Well, this is going to be a bit of a strange answer, but I think the reason why I love to write is that I can't play sports anymore, right? I tore up my knee in college, and the thing I loved about playing sports was being in the zone, being in the moment, being totally committed to a particular task or activity um, in a way that, you know, it's not that I don't do other things where I give a full effort, but you just don't feel that same urgency say when you're washing the dishes or driving to pick up groceries, right? So um, there are a few things in life where I think you can be 100% passionate and committed. And when I tore up my knee and I couldn't play sports anymore, um, I had a lot of energy stored up, like what was I going to do with it? And what I realized is that writing is the other place that I can really feel that. When I'm writing a novel or writing a story or writing a poem, if I'm totally immersed in it, you know, I'm kind of it's, it's that same in the zone feeling, that same total commitment to pushing myself 100%, right? Um, I describe, I, I think a lot of times people think of writers as being kind of miserable, um, that it's this painstaking task, but I would describe myself more as like a happy writer. Okay. Even if I'm writing about difficult topics, you know, topics that are tragic or, or really challenging, uh, I 
feel like the activity of writing is something I just enjoy doing because it is that 100% immersion. It's really pushing myself, really trying to focus. And so that's what I love about it more than anything else. And of course, I just love frolicking, you know, in the realm of imagination, playing with language, those kinds of things. But, but more than anything, it's just that feeling of I am totally committed to this moment and what I'm trying to accomplish here. Nice. So that's a wonderful answer. And it leads me right to my next question. I mean, how often do you find yourself writing poetry that you feel that need to get into that zone? I mean, is it an everyday thing or, you know, when the feeling mm -hmm. grabs you? Yeah, I wish it were, right? I, I, I wish I had that moment um, all the time. But, you know, being a parent of two children, being a full-time sure. teacher, um, working often a second job, whether that's delivering pizza or driving Lyft or whatever it is, um, I don't actually often have those like four or five hour stretches to be able to really do it. So I do it whenever I can. And I have actually trained myself to write a lot at school when I give students time for writing. So I might be like 15 minutes in class that okay. it's, I've learned how to block out everything else and just devote myself for those 15 minute stretches. So I would say that I try to write poems uh, you know, two to three times a month, maybe, but I'm also writing fiction. I'm also writing nonfiction. Um, I'm trying to do editing of work that I've already written, which is, I think, also a really wonderful and energizing task. So I, I try to write at least a little bit every day if I can. I'm not saying that often that that totally happens, right. but as much as possible, I try to do that at least a little bit every day. Well, that's beautiful. So thank you. So um, I guess. Uh, I would like you to share a poem with us right now, you know, just to, if you have any selected and, and just want to hear from the teacher pizza guy. Sure. Um, let me start with this one. Um, it's relatively short. I, I think this is one that I, it's on my mind right now because, um, you know, during this pandemic, it's been obviously a time when people have been in isolation a sure. lot and you know, one of the things about delivering pizza is you can't really just do it for the money because there's just not enough money in it, right? You're not going to walk out of there, you know, a, a stockbroker. So right. for me, there had to be something beyond that. And this, this poem called Purveyor of Pies, which is after a poem by a really great writer named Jeff McDaniel and his poem, Keeper of the Light, uh, is a poem about what else is going on every time you show up at someone's door. And now this whole kind of like contactless delivery is a whole nother element that maybe takes away from some of what was at least partially why you do, you deliver pizza, right? Okay, so okay. purveyor of pies. Yes, I will interrupt your life. Knock on your door or call your phone. And chances are we don't know each other have no idea which channels our televisions kiss most frequently or how many times the images of our bodies buried in dirt render us unable to sleep. Yet, I know what you want to eat and at what time you made your definitive decision to order. Nobody's day is easy. If tonight you don't want to sift through the pantry, see what you can cobble together. If today you did not have time to shop for groceries, if this evening, you just have a hankering for a medium barbecued chicken with sweet baby rays, cranberries, and red onions. No, I am not here to judge. Your life is your own. I will interrupt it, yes, but only for brief moments. We will meet on your doorstep or in the apartment foyer. Perhaps your dog will bark or attempt an escape to the beckoning wild. Perhaps your toddler will answer the knock and look at me with eyes both excited and afraid. I, a stranger at the gate, mean only the opposite of harm. Mean only I am here, arrived, more or less on time, to provide you with sustenance, to let you know when you desired, we did our best to fulfill. When I leave, you will shut your door, return your world to its ordered momentum, the only alien infiltration easily digestible, its cardboard container easily recyclable. I will move on to the next house, the next dorm, the next apartment complex, and interrupt another life. I am here, you conjured, and I 
appeared. That's beautiful. I remember reading that poem. I, if I may comment on that, I think the thing that I really love about your poetry, being somebody who's worked service jobs like that, many of us have, is yeah. the nobility that you give to those jobs. I, I, and I know that sounds strange, but that's, a, that's a, a feeling that I kept getting from your poetry is that, you know, working those jobs, you feel like they're very thankless at times, but your poetry really gives almost a nobility to it. And could you comment on that at all? Well, I think that's, you know, was one of my real goals in writing the book was to tell the stories, not just of me, but of, you know, people who are, in the in the service industry and delivering food or or working as you know waiters or or servers or whatever um and it can feel thankless right but it these are actually often really high skill positions sure. you need a lot of stamina you need to know what you're doing you need to not make mistakes right i mean as a teacher i can make a mistake and, and correct it pretty easily right like i'll be like oh um you know i, I said something wrong in my analysis of a of literature let's look at this a second time but if I mess up somebody's pizza and it has the wrong topping on it, or I forgot the milkshake, that's like a huge problem. It is. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, and for me, there's something magical, right? There's something magical. Like you, you cast your rod out into the abyss in the form of a telephone call or an order online where you're like, I want this pizza, with these toppings, and I want it at this time. And, you know, you think it's going to happen, right. but I think always you harbor just a little bit of doubt. Are they going to mess it up? Is it really going to come? Are they going to miss my order? Is it going to be late? And when you can be on the other end of that and be that person that's like, this is what you wanted. We did exactly what you wanted. We got it to you on time. There's a satisfaction that comes with doing that. And there's a kind of magic to it because you're absolving doubt, right? As a teacher, I'll come to class and half the time, you know, students don't want to see me. They want to be still on their phone or they want to be sleeping still or for whatever reason, it's not like I'm making them happy by being present in the classroom. But if I show up with a pizza, I'm almost universally making somebody happy, right? So that part is what makes it worthwhile because awesome. the money is not, not good enough, right? And, and it, the money should be better and for teaching and for service jobs, right? And people should tip better. But, you know, at least you can get some satisfaction out of knowing somebody kind of wanted the universe to be in their favor and you made it in their favor. And that, what's amazing about that too, if I may comment, is the fact that you talk about the pandemic, those jobs now really are the essential jobs, right? I mean, they are the essential ones. They didn't stop through this whole thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And like that, that kind of, you know, obviously I wrote this poem a couple of years ago, but it's sort of like the idea of, you know, the person delivering something to your house is kind of an alien infiltrating your fortress, your, your home base, your structure, right? But if, if I'm gonna do that, if I'm gonna be a stranger at your doorstep, you know, I don't want to cause any harm, right? Like I want to make this experience a good one for you. Right. Um, I don't want to damage you or threaten you in any way. And I think that that's, you know, on the top of the minds, not only people ordering food, but the people preparing it, right? Like they can't just go through the motions. They have to make sure that they're not transmitting any kind of germs or virus and that they're doing um, what is necessary to make sure that this is a safe experience for the person. And I, I think that needs to be recognized as important for, um, you know, recognizing those people doing that work. Nice. You know, you mentioned Jeff McDaniels and, you know, a, a poet, you know, who influences poem, um, if I may say that. Who, what other poets do you read? Who other, what other poets that you like to, you know, look at and, and gain inspiration from? Well, I mean, certainly I love contemporary poetry. You know, there are some classical poets that I like to, um, you know, Dylan Thomas and, uh, um, you know, Whitman and people like that. But for the most part, most of my poetry reading is contemporary poets. And I love and adore and have learned so much from, like I mentioned, Tim Siebel's, uh, okay. Patricia Smith, Patrick Rosal, phenomenal Filipino-American poet, uh, Ross Gay, love him, Aris Elise um, These are all writers um, who I think are really funneling the modern the contemporary landscape in in really interesting and powerful ways Dennis smith uh nate marshall kevin Koval, and then i have a bunch of students you know who, who've gone on to publish their work who i love their work as well angel nafis and adam faulkner has a new book out um called the willies and uh autumn Choi wild has a great book out called cut to bloom okay. so there's i mean there's just contemporary poets 
out there that I, that I adore. I would say my real go-tos, though, I would say are probably Patrick Rosal, uh, Patricia Smith, Tim Siebel's, Ross Gay, Arcelise Gourmet, those five. That's and probably you think like about contemporary poets. Is there like a, a, a running, uh, I don't want to say theme because I'll use that too much, but I mean, you know, like, is there a similarity or a commonality between those poets that you find? Uh, you know, are they speaking about everyday life? Uh, what is it that you find about those poets that, you know, really grabs you? I think what all those poets do um, and what I try to do. Um, I don't want to say Im imitation of them, but sort of in the same conversation with them is, sure. is uh, look at what's happening in the world and slow it down and try to isolate moments of joy, of wonder, of despair, of inspiration, of confusion, um, and dig into those moments and try to understand what they mean, or at least ask questions about them and mark it as like, this is a particular moment in time that needs to be talked about, right? So Ross Gay has this incredible poem of witness. Uh, I think it's called Two Bikers Embrace on Broad Street, right? Which is about two big kind of burly motorcycle guys hugging in the middle of the street, right? And so like, for him, he's like, I need to write something about that. What does it mean that these two guys are hugging in the middle of the street, right? Um, or Patricia Smith looking at Hurricane Katrina and writing a whole book of poems, uh, Blood Dazzler, about what that meant, like that that hurricane just devastated the city of New Orleans and those communities, right? And, um, and so she writes all these persona poems in the voices of the hurricane or in the voice of people who were abandoned in a nursing home, right? So it's again, it's kind of like documenting the world but also digging into the world and trying to understand what it means. And for me in this book, it was kind of like, all right, you're delivering pizza, you're teaching, that's a really hard life, right? So you're, you're waking up at 6.30 in the morning to get ready for school. You're in school from eight o'clock to 3.30. You go home, you do some work, you nap or whatever. You go to the, to, to the pizza place, you're on shift from six at night until sometimes five in the morning and going to the school the next day, how are you surviving that, right? Mm -hmm. How are you getting through it? And the only way I could really get through it is to say, okay, this has to be a learning experience for me. Not just about how to make a pizza, how to deliver a pizza properly, how to make the Caesar salad that goes with it, how to answer the phones, how to do the dishes. I'm learning all those things, sure. but also learning like, what is this relationship? between me, the pizza guy, and the people I'm delivering pizza to. What am I learning about the city of Ann Arbor, which you mentioned uh, earlier. What am I learning about the city of Ann Arbor, where, like in terms of where I'm delivering these pizzas? Right. Who's, who's more likely to tip? How do you get from place to place in the quickest amount of time? What am I learning about that? And what am I learning about myself in terms of how I'm going to survive this? And so the only way for me to get through those long nights um, of, working in the pizza parlor and then the next endless day of being in school and trying to do my best as a teacher was to document moments, slow them down, think about them and be energized by kind of understanding. Right. So, um, let me read yeah. another poem. Um, oh. if that, if that's okay, that kind of talks about that. Right. And sure. this one kind of combines, um, the school experience and the, the, the delivering pizza experience. And it has to do with um, a rule that we have at school, which is that kids cannot wear their headphones at school, right? And, and I, I just think that sometimes we need to be thinking about, in the same way that now our culture is thinking about how are we looking at police? How are we looking at climate? How are we looking at things we've always done? Think about, well, how are we doing things the, the best possible way for everyone? And what is the true story? So, you know, we have this rule at Pioneer that kids are not supposed to wear headphones in in class, which is fine, but they're also not supposed to wear them in the hallway or, you know, and I always question that. So this is kind of about music and, and I do sing in this poem and I tend to sing really poorly, but I'm not apologizing for that. I just, you know, I just wanted to mention. No, man, go ahead. That's all right. You probably sing better than me. Okay. <laughs> Poem's called Young Man Take Your Headphones Out. All right. Young man, take your headphones out is the refrain of Ian's poem and the refrain he hears each morning 
when he pushes into the building at 7.30, sleet sting in his face. Young man, take your headphones out, Ian hears and obeys long enough to move past the line of sight of the assistant principal yelling at him through a megaphone before he puts him back in. Young man, take your headphones out, Ian hears in his sleep when he eats a foil pack of Pop-Tarts for breakfast as he clambers onto his bicycle and whatever the weather rides it to school. Young man, take your headphones out, I hear as I pull into traffic, seeing Ian's anguished face as he sits atop the classroom radiator, hearing his throaty voice when he reads his poem, as I half listen to the radio, late already, on my way to deliver my 20th pizza of the night. Young man, take your headphones out, I hear, as the first few notes from Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You play through the car speakers, and despite my tardiness, I pull over into a 7-Eleven parking lot. Young man, take your headphones out, Ian repeats, as the anchor of his poem, a custody-sharing tale of three days a week with his father, four with his mother. Young man, take your headphones out as he rides his bike, back and forth between parents. The only thing he takes with him everywhere is music. The only stability in his life, on his bike, in the hallways, in his head, his music. Young man, take your headphones out, disappears as I sit in the parking lot, engine running for three minutes, just so I can hear Whitney drag out that long, ah, about five, six of the way through that song. And how just that single stretched out vowel, that one sparkling sound will buoy me through the rest of this shift maybe the rest of the week, the school year, who knows, maybe even my whole damn career. Nice. Very good. So I got a question about that. So yes. was there a kid that you had this based on? Was this a composite of children? I mean, you talked about the headphones. I mean, because you know that the custody, right? I mean, that's a really common. So was, was there a kid that you had that based upon right there? I mean, that, that was amazing. By the way. Absolutely. That's based on a specific, specific student Right. who wrote a poem whose refrain was young man take your headphones out and how he kept hearing that from the assistant principal you know and i basically was so kind of struck by it and moved by it that i started writing my own poem based on his poem i told him i said you know i said sam i, I you know i i loved your poem and i want to kind of do my own version and talk about it what it was like from my perspective and he loved that idea and he loves that it's in the book you know, so um, I think for me, it's sort of like, okay, you know, I needed music to get through those long nights delivering pizzas, right? And there were times like that one where I would just be like, I know I need to get this pie to somebody, but I also need to hit the, hear this Whitney Houston song. So I'm just going to like pull over. And when I'm done, I'll go deliver the pie. But we don't afford that same courtesy to our students right. who may also be trying to get through the day, get through their parents divorce, whatever they're going through, and the music is really important to them in the school day, and yet we're like, get rid of those headphones, you know? And so that's kind of what I was trying to, to get to in, in that. Place. And I love, I love that idea of you, like, you know, saying like, there is instability in this person's life, except for that music, and here we are trying to deny that music to that person. I mean, at least that's what I took from it, so I. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. So let me ask you a question. When you were writing these poems, did you know a book was gonna come out of this? Were you thinking about a book? So initially, no, right? Initially, I was just like, okay, I'm going to take this job, which was really a third job at the time, just to meet bills at this time, because I was working already full-time in the school and about 20 hours a week at the teen center, running the literary arts program there, um, and still wasn't able to cover my bills. And I was like, okay, I'm going to take this job and do what I need to do and, and cover the bills. Uh, but it was so hard. It was just sure. the lack of sleep. Um, various other things that were happening. It was just really, really difficult. Um, and and kind of like I was mentioning earlier, I just started documenting moments um, and scribbling things on receipts and, you know, in my phone that I thought, okay, this is interesting. Maybe it'll be a poem someday. And then I had four or five pieces that I thought of as kind of the beginnings of poems. Uh, and then eventually I wrote this one poem, which, which maybe I'll read, which is kind of the, uh, the foundation of the book. 
right? Which is, it's in the middle of the book and it's a poem about called The Manager Talks About Getting Engaged. And it was about talking to my manager who used to be my student. Yep. So he saw me in a very different light than some of the other people that were working there. So he would have conversations with me with, which were personal, you know, and he'd ask me for advice, which is an interesting dynamic, right? Because he's in charge of the store. This is a very, very busy store. It's right across the street from the U of M campus. We're delivering, you know, hundreds of pieces a day. If it's a football Saturday, it's, you know, maybe a thousand, it's nuts, sure. right? So he, you know, he knew what he was doing and I didn't know what I was doing as a pizza guy, but he respected me nonetheless because I'd been his teacher years earlier. So he would ask me questions. And one time he was considering, you know, asking his girlfriend to marry him. And so he asked me, what was it like when I got engaged? Um, and when I wrote this poem, um, I was like, okay, you know what? There really might be a book here. And that was, that was kind of, in terms of the school year, that was in like, I want to say December or January or something like that. And from that moment on, I did start with a little more intentionality to be like, okay, this could be a poem, taking down notes. And then I sort of realized that I didn't want to just write about being the pizza guy, but I wanted to write about what the whole year was like being a teacher, trying to teach and trying to deliver pizzas. And that's kind of how it came about. It was sort of organic. I did not go in with that idea, but it, it sort of grew on me. And after I wrote this poem, um, which maybe I'll share with you now, it's, a, it's yeah. a longer poem, but I think it is my favorite poem in the book. And it's the one that means the most to me for, for various reasons. Um, after this poem, I knew there could be a manuscript here and I got mm -hmm. serious about it. So it's called, The Manager Talks About Getting Engaged. I think I'm ready, he says. What was it like for you? Did you do anything special? The story is, yes, it was in fact special, but not because of any particular planning or creative proposaling. It was spontaneous and actually, I don't wanna talk about it. Despite all my admonitions to my creative writing students about vanquishing, vanquishing vagueness, it's not a story I like to share. It involves Santa Cruz, and sea lions and a tall bearded man playing bagpipes in the midst of a mournful fog. And that's all I'm going to say. This story is for me and for Karen and maybe one day for our children. I hold it tight to my chest. I don't want to keep it like that. An heirloom. Except it's nearing 5 a.m. when he asks and I'm mopping the floor. Sort of. It's been a long unnerving night ice and snow and roads that want to bite and he's counting money in the register and accomplishing other mysterious paperwork related functions. I think I made about $105 in tips, add on the 54 cents per mile and the 525 an hour salary and I'm around 180 bucks for 11 hours. Not horrible. The floor sneers daunting and salty and the water in the mop bucket already swims swampy so I'm swishing back and forth as quickly as I can but the truth is the world's not a whole lot cleaner. And my arms and upper back feel like I just survived six minutes wrestling against a state champ. So I'm half tempted to tell the story just to cheer my own damn self up. Earlier, a university professor tipped $5 on a $97 bill. And he also declined to meet me at the door in the midst of the snowiest bluster, sent down a student clearly unprepared to schlep seven pizzas, including one gluten-free, upstairs to the classroom, so I did it for him. An extra 10 minutes of my time while another customer's delivery camped in the car, and I don't know what kind of class it was, possibly marketing, something in that how to make money by lying to people genre. About 30 undergrads inhabited the classroom, each likely capable of chipping in a buck, though none offered. And I considered making a public announcement, exposing their instructor as a 6% tipper after he asked me a bunch of bullshit questions like, do I get sick of, sick of pizza? And does my car smell like pizza? And so much of me wanted to say, listen up, students. This dude right here who's grading your papers, or more likely, forcing that job onto a graduate assistant who gets paid little more than expired lettuce, is trying to make nice with me act like he recognizes the complexity of my humanity, but he just tipped five bucks on a $97 bill, and you do the math. That adds up to an asshole at the extreme tail of the bell curve, and I got 
Two kids I'm not putting to bed right now, not helping with their homework, not standing next to in the washroom as they floss and brush their teeth, and I still got nine hours to go on this shift, then I sleep two hours and snap my sorry ass away from my son's hockey game. So if you learn one lesson this semester, how about it's every person who's ever served you anything, fed you, or cooked for you, or refilled your coffee, or refolded a sweater you left in a heap after fingering through the bargain rack. Every dang one of them might have a magical story comprised of sea lions and bagpipes and mournful fog they hold close to their chest. Mm. But I don't say any of that. And I feel smaller for it. I want to be that fiery teacher I once was, unafraid of losing his job, unwilling to compromise a principal belief or stand in muted silence when an explosion's brewing in his throat. And the manager's looking up from his register, his own shoulders looking like pumpkins three weeks after Halloween, deflated, nibbled apart by squirrels. And I push that mop harder, try now to make that floor Cinderella sparkle. For we who close the store at 5 a.m. must be our own fairy godmothers, our own Prince Charmings. There is no, no one else in this moment for us, no one thinking of us but us and I polished that floor so it shines like a glass slipper and the bark of sea lions lurches upward from hundreds of feet below the craggy cliffs and it roars onto my tongue. Actually, I say, actually, special doesn't begin to describe. It was in Santa Cruz and we were on this bluff and the wind had that kind of chill like somebody pressing fingernails into the hollows of your back. So I gave her my sweatshirt. It was royal blue with, for some reason, the number 88 sewn onto the front on a white patch. And we could hear some guy playing bagpipes, sending his screeching prayer into the mist. And down below on the beach, sea lions. Down below on the beach, she looked at me. And we could hear, and she started nodding her head. And I said, what are you saying yes to? What are you saying yes to? But I already knew. That's an awesome poem. So I got a bunch of questions on that one. So first of all, there's, <laughs> a whole, there's that whole nobility aspect, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the service worker. But something that really grabbed me in that poem, and, and you know, it had been talked about when we were doing the selection of the books that this book really talked to Ann Arbor. And for some reason, like I, not for some reason. In this poem, I get a real strong sense of that city. Can you talk about that? I mean, you talk about the three jobs. You talk about this university professor who is only tipping, what did you say, 6%. I mean, what is it about Ann Arbor that comes through in this book for you? And then what did you try to put of Ann Arbor into this book, be it socioeconomic or, you know, society? Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I just... No, no. I mean, okay. So... It was a really interesting dynamic for me, right? right? Because as a high school teacher at Pioneer High School, which is a well-regarded high school, sure. um, you know, I generally get respect from most of the people in the community, mm -hmm. right? Like they, you know, they're parents of kids who are the same age as my kids and we're at sporting events on the sideline. If they ask me what I do or they know me already, and they're like, oh yeah, how's Pioneer? You know, they, they kind of respect that, right? right? Um, and they think what I'm doing is a worthy endeavor as a teacher, which I think so too, right? And some of the most awkward moments of this whole experience was delivering to them, sure. right? Like I delivered pizzas to my students and that was a little weird, but they mostly knew I was delivering pizza anyway, so that was fine. Um, I delivered to former students at U of M for whom I had written letters of recommendation mm. and I would show up at two or three in the morning at their dorm and they're plastered out of their minds mm. and that was weird too right. that was a little bit awkward they're like uh why are you delivering me a pizza <laughs> and also you shouldn't see me like this right now right but the hardest was delivering to neighbors like i said people will become my friends because their parents of kids are the same age as my kids and sure. they do activities sure. together and to be at their door and be like here's your extra large pepperoni, you know, 32 liter of Coke or whatever. Um, and it's kind of unspoken as to why I'm out there delivering them their, their pizzas, but they know. 
clearly the teacher is not making enough money to support his kid being on the softball team where I already am. So then we kind of talk and, you know, nobody wants to ask difficult questions and they'll give me, you know, I'm just thinking, just, you know, give me an extra dollar for a tip and let's get out of here and let's end this thing. Right. right. Um, so that was one of the hardest dynamics. And it's weird also to think about people at the school getting a world-class education. Right. Um, and knowing that if I come deliver pizza to them, they're not thinking that I also have an undergrad degree, two master's degrees, you know, and I'm out here delivering pizzas. Um, and, and so everything that is kind of maybe the darker side of Ann Arbor, which is, you know, the kind of income, income inequities, um, the way that people from out of town who are really wealthy but can so can pay the out-of-state tuition and demanding these beautiful high-rise apartment buildings in the city. Um, you know, all of that plays out to that person who's delivering food around the city, right? And you're you're going to the various addresses. And so it was a different understanding of the city than I was already getting, which is learning about the children of the city through my job as a teacher. And and combining both of those really gave me an interesting perspective on what Ann Arbor is like, um, not only geographically, but in terms of class stratifications, mm. where do the wealthy people live? What kind of food are they ordering? When do they order the food? You know, really rich people really love to order, you know, during the Michigan football games, if they're not already at the game, right? right. Um, and the best tippers were always the people on the job, right? Like whoever's working, if I'm delivering to the police station, they're going to tip well. If I'm delivering to the guy who's fixing um, the electrical system at some U of M building at one in the morning, they're going to tip well, okay. right? If I'm delivering to the doorman in one of these high rise apartments, they're going to tip well because they understand, they understand like what the worker is sure. and really learning that. It's interesting, you know, it's not like after this book came out, all of a sudden I like make enough money to support everything, right? So prior to the pandemic, what I was doing was driving lifts. And that's even more of a lens into um, your city's culture because who needs a ride and for what reason and where are you dropping them off, right? Yeah. Like a, a customer that you're driving home because they just finished their shift working at a, as a cashier at Meijer is way different than, you know, the customer who wants to go to the bar and get drunk and not worry about driving, right? And so that was all, that's also like a really interesting perspective on the city and for me again as a worker like i was saying before i can't just like it's a paycheck's not enough like my brain has to be doing something sure. so learning about the city was part of this whole journey for sure so can i ask i mean it leads me into a question um so you, political would you consider this as kind of like the political aspect of this book social inequality what do you what, what do you think is political about this book definitely i mean i think first of all i think it writing from the perspective of, of a blue collar worker is political because we don't often hear those stories, particularly in art, right? You know, there's a million books out there written by university professors kind of about the life of the university professor. And there's a lot of poems about here's how I tend my backyard garden. Right. Um, but how many poems are you going to have about, you know, delivering a pizza and to say this is worthy subject matter, is a political statement in itself, right? Like it is worthy to talk about somebody taking off their clothes when you're trying to deliver them a pizza. It is worthy to talk about, <laughs> thank you. It is worthy to talk about somebody calling up from Kalamazoo and expecting you to deliver to them, right? Yeah. Like that, the subject matter is worthwhile. So that's number one, right? right, right. And number two, obviously I am not the only teacher who has to work a second job or a third job. You know, it's just not the case. And I think the statistics, you know, if they say 20 or 30% of teachers also have another job, you know, people can read that statistic and, okay, whatever, it's a statistic. But to tell the story, here's what it's like. Here's what it's like, I'm teaching your kid. Do you want me out there at four or five in the morning doing dishes still, driving on the roads, showing up into class the next day? You know, is that what you want? Right. And, and then, you know, obviously there's some poems in there that that take on things like the rule of no headphones or um, standardized testing and things like that. And, and just trying to kind of slip in some commentary about how we think about education. Um, if there's anything that's 
good that's come out of this pandemic. I think there has been some discussion about what makes for a worthwhile educational experience, sure. right? And, and, you know, I mean, our Betsy DeVos would love to see everybody online all the time, right? And with prepackaged curriculum. But I think people are recognizing that this is not how people learn best right. um, at home in front of their computers. So I think from that standpoint, talking about how we value our educators, talking about how we value our service people, um, what's the intersection of both those things, that's really where the, the politics is in the book. But I also didn't want to come across as like whining about it, you know, and, right. and I wanted to find the moments that made um, the job worthwhile. So, yeah. So leading into that with the current events and everything else, how do you think the pandemic and the Black Lives Movement and the whole situation that our country and our state and your community are in right now how do you think that's affected your writing and your teaching right now yeah well i mean obviously the black lives matter movement has been going on for a while right. um and for as a teach as a teacher and this is being you know accelerated in in the last month i have to be thinking about as a white male and i have students of color what are my implicit biases mm. you know what what am I doing to help those students succeed? And what am I doing either consciously or unconsciously that's hurting their chances to succeed, right? Mm -hmm. So really thinking about um, how can I be more inclusive as a teacher? I think being a teacher of writing, that is much easier than say being a teacher of you know, geometry in that standpoint, because I can ask students for their stories. I can value their stories. Um, I can tell them to write from their own experiences. And I think that that lets them understand that they are important, that their lives matter in every sense. Right. Um, I do have a short poem, it's, um, which kind of gets to this a little bit. Um, it's called Marty Blows Up. And it's obviously less than, you know, what's happening in terms of intensity of what's happening right now. But I think it gets to some of those themes. Let me, I'll just read this real quickly. Yeah, please. Uh, Marty blows up. In government class, he and his peers watch a video, Donald Trump on The View, arguing why he doesn't trust Obama's birth certificate. Whoopi Goldberg fires back loud and angry, but the white women on the show stay silent, mouths and hands folded above the fray. That nipped at me, Marty says. If he's being racist, how come only black people seem to care? Mm. Marty's got glasses and talks with his hands and sometimes eats lunch in my classroom and likes to describe complex anime narratives or Super Smash Brothers strategies while I sort of pay attention. It's kind of like, Marty goes on, when a teacher picks on a black kid who's got his phone out and the white kids texting under their desks don't say anything. They just keep on doing what they're doing. It's like whatever the teacher's saying to the black kid has nothing to do with them at all so i think that what that poem is telling me it's holding me accountable as a teacher to say it's not enough just to have good intentions and to be out there saying well i try to treat all my students equally but do i really and do i look into every situation to say well how is this kid of color who's in the room you know going to be experiencing what i'm doing right now um what can i do actively not just like well yeah it's my belief that of course i'm fair to everyone in the classroom but what can i actively do to make sure that my classroom is a welcoming and nourishing place for all my students mm. and i think that's really what my focus is this summer as i start thinking about what school is going to be like in the fall whether we're online or in person at school, or whether it's some hybrid of both, what am I going to be doing to do better um, in terms of making my classroom a place that all students can thrive? Now, I don't know that I'm gonna get there 100% um, and make sure that everybody gets everything they can in my class, but I'm gonna try. So that's what I'm trying to do this summer is, is read books, rethink some of my teaching strategies, rethink some of my curriculum, and think about what can I do to make my classroom a place where the students of color understand that their lives absolutely matter. Can I ask a question then? 
and something I just thought about when you were talking. I mean, these service jobs, I mean, they really give you a whole nother dimension. And I mean, did you, you've been teaching a while and you take these service jobs, you know, for limited periods of time, maybe. I mean, did you find your, your understanding of social inequality deepening with these jobs? Or do you think you already came into them uh, with that understanding from teaching and these kids that you're, you know, interacting with on a daily basis? No question that my perspective has gotten deeper and more complex, right? Um, I think sometimes we operate at schools like, okay, this kid, you know, was tardy five times this semester. And if they try to do that at their job, you know, they're going to be in trouble. They're going to get fired. Right. And we kind of have that point of view. But what we don't think about is that kid who might be tardy five or six times in my class or miss days completely might be 100% on time and the most responsible kid at their job, right? And that's one of the things that I learned for sure is that, you know, it'd be interesting because I was one of the older workers, you know, in the pizza parlor, sadly not the oldest, mm -hmm. but I was one of the older workers. And a lot of the younger people would talk to me and be saying, well, you know, I wasn't much of a student in high school. I wish I could go back and do better. Um, you know, I was a real jerk in my class or whatever but they were really good workers. They were skilled in what they were doing. Um, and so for me, I'm just not sure that correlation of some kid who doesn't like do all the reading in my English class means he's not gonna be a productive citizen later on. And I think that that was a good and important lesson for me to understand because I, sometimes as a teacher, we feel like, oh, if that kid's not making the effort well, I'm not going to make the effort towards them. You know, what can I do about that kid who never shows up to my class? But the truth is, we don't know why that kid's not making an effort. We don't know what the, situ the circumstances are. And if we do dig a little deeper and try to understand the kid's story, maybe there is a way that we can get the kid interested. But we don't have to take that default position of, hey, I'm here. I can, you know, I can leave, leave the horse to water, but I can't make them drink kind of thing. You know, like, I, I don't know. I think that's something I certainly learned. And, and like you said before, the nobility and the dignity of these professions as well are important too. Because when I have a kid, you know, and I have plenty of kids who are working, um, doing similar jobs, delivering pizza or being the person making the pizzas or somebody working at a grocery store, um, you know, and I, and I want to value them a lot more, you know. And so I say to them, hey, I just wrote a whole damn book about my job delivering pizza right about yours yeah. right about your experience and we've got some of the greatest people we've gotten have been kids talking about what it's like to work behind a deli counter you know at uh at bushes or something like that and, yeah. and i think that's you know that's a that's a big part of it too so let me ask you a question so just you know maybe to, to finish up a little bit here so um for you like why should people read poetry right like why should they read teacher pizza guy what what is it that you think reading poetry does for someone be it the kid or be an adult like myself like why should we read poetry jeff wow that's a good question um <laughs> all right throw the hardest I one i've mentioned a couple times that what i think the best writers do whether it's fiction nonfiction, or poetry um is slow down the world take a second look at things. And we live in a very, very fast paced world. One good thing about the pandemic is maybe it showed me and, and some other people too how to slow down a little bit, right? But I think when we take the time to read a poem means that we're investing that same desire to slow down the world as a person who slowed down the world to write it, right? So I think, reading a poem is an act of I want to stay present in the moment I'm in and not let the world just usher me along, right? If you make it a priority in your life to say, I want to just spend a few minutes reading a poem, you're saying, I want to spend a few minutes enriching my mind, enriching my imagination, right? And I'll be honest, I'm, in terms of the spectrum of like, accessibility of poetry i think my poetry is pretty damn accessible you know i'm i'm not writing poems as like puzzles for people to figure out i'm writing poems that i'm trying to hopefully uh 
illuminate true experiences and dig for some meaning in them and maybe offer some insight for other people to, to understand the world around them and themselves a little more, right? So I think if you want to engage in that activity, then that's why you read. And that's what poetry is for. And, and it's for documenting, memorializing, commemorating, um, you know, I, what I try, one thing I tell my students is when you're writing fiction, I think your goal is to take that reader and usher them into a world away from the world they're sitting in, right? So, you know, if you're writing Harry Potter, you're taking them into Hogwarts, right? If you're writing um, Wizard of Oz, you're taking them to Oz, right? But I think a poem serves a different purpose. You're not necessarily trying to usher the reader into a different world. You're trying to make the reader maybe more acutely aware of the world in which they already inhabit, which I think fiction ultimately tries to do too, but it's a different route to it. But yeah. poetry, I think, is like that arrow that pierces that says, mm -hmm. open your eyes, pay attention. Whether you're writing about that spider's journey across the window pane or you're writing about um, you know, a pepperoni pizza, I think what you're trying to do is say, look at this experience, it's here, it's right in front of your eyes. Pay attention, open up. And so I think that's why people should read poems. Beautiful. So Jeff, because we are uh, talking about Michigan Notable Books, what did it mean for you to be a winner of the Michigan Notable Book Award this year? Well, I mean, it's a huge honor. I would say maybe 15 something years ago when I was on the board of directors for the uh, Ann Arbor Book Festival, we did a big um, kind of uh, reception at the library and invited a bunch of Michigan Notable Book authors. And I remember meeting a bunch of them and uh, my friend Steve Amick, I believe was one of them at the time. And sure, sure. they were all, you know, they had like a, a flower or something that denoted them as a yeah. Michigan Notable Book author. And I just thought, you know, one day, it would be awesome to be counted among that circle. And now I feel really proud to be able to do that. And I think, you know, obviously the, the Michigan Libraries is an amazing organization and I have the opportunity to go to libraries, to reach out to libraries, to get my book into different libraries and get more people reading it. Um, you know, as a writer, that's what you want, right? You want people to, to read your words. So I think it, it's, a, it's a tremendous accomplishment um, and a tremendous honor. And I, I feel very privileged that people looked at my work and decided it was worth recognizing. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. And I, I want you to know it was an honor just to read your book and, and, and to really like study it and get to know it. And to all of you out there, um, if you haven't had the chance, Teacher Pizza Guy, Wayne State University Press by Jeff Cass, who we've been talking to, uh, Michigan Notable Book Award winner 2020. And look forward to in the future, any, uh, we're going to have future conversations with other Notable Book Award winners. And Jeff, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, keep writing, please. Thank you, Tim. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for thinking of me. You're welcome.